action. So you're welcome to ask questions as we go through. And if um, it if it's a little, if it takes it too far off the um, track, then I'll just ask if we can talk about that when we're done. So um, are there any things that you want to make sure that I cover? Because a lot of times when people attend events like this, they come with questions already. Are there anything specific that you want to make sure that I cover as I go through? Lou? This was supposed to be about advanced directives. Yes, we are going to we are oh. going to cover advanced directives. So that's really what you're most interested in, Lou. No, that's why I tuned in. Okay, good. Okay, we'll talk about that. Nola, one question: Will you cover anything about putting insurance into a trust or a, some kind of document like that? Sure, I'll be happy to cover that. Excellent. Okay. Good, that's helpful to know kind of. Okay, good. So we're just gonna run through all the documents and talk a little bit about how things work and, and that kind of thing. So, let's see. Is there, let me see, is there a... So I can't really see the presentation, Jay. Is, I, I will kick that up. Oh, okay. There we go. That should be coming up live. Okay. How's that? Oops. Does everybody see that? There we go. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a little bit about me. Um, I do serve on the board of Benavia, and this is a great organization. Um, for resources in the community as well as referring people over. During the pandemic, we've had two grandchildren born, so I have five, five grandchildren now. It's a lot, and they're, they're a lot more fun than kids. So, all right, we can go to the next. So I'm an elder law attorney. I've been practicing for over 20 years, and we're just gonna go some, through some of the things that um, my clients have questions about and things like that. So first of all, as you age, it, I think it's always important to understand what community resources are accessible to you. So here's some of the different um, organizations that offer help as you age. Um, and most of the, so the federal government loves it if you try to stay at home as long as possible when you age. And so all the government money goes into what's called the Area Agency on Aging. And then the Area Agency on Aging gives um, grant money and other support financially to some of these other organizations. So anyone in the whole entire country has an Area Agency on Aging that's assigned to them. So even if you have family members somewhere else, that's always a great place to start for resources. Um, Area Agency on Aging works really closely with Benavia um, and Benavia kind of does a lot of uh, outreach for seniors in, in the West Valley. So um, here's some different organizations if you're needing help, it's especially now when people are lonely, not connected, um, important to know that each of these different organizations exist. So just wanted to give you that. You can go next. Oh yes, Beverly. <laughs> Jay, can you? Oh, there what, is, what is the Foundation for Senior Living? So Foundation for Senior Living is a, a nonprofit organization that helps people find like HUD housing and senior subsidized housing and, and different things like that. They, they do a couple other things. Like for example, if you're a caregiver and you wanted to kind of see the different technology of things um, to try to help someone who is aging and has some physical limitations, like different things that they've developed for eating for someone with Parkinson's or things like that. They have other resources. They teach classes about, um, like sometimes I have them come out to my support group and they'll teach classes on like safe lifting and different things like that. 
They're, they're, a, they're a really great organization. Nola. Are they down in the southern part of the state or just up here in the Phoenix area? Um, they have, they support different projects throughout the whole entire state, but their main office is in downtown Phoenix. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, next. Lou, go ahead and talk. Sorry, Lou has a question. Oh, yeah. yes, Lou. Are, are there any state resources? So, it, uh, so these are all local. Um, or federal. State. They are all state, except for the VA is obviously federal. So federal money comes in, but it has to be used locally through the state. So all of these are um, the state organizations. Are you talking, are you asking about state resources for like long-term care or something like that? Well, all kinds of state resources are available. Yes, and city too. So yep. there are some city resources, but it, if you contacted the Area Agency on Aging or Benavia, they would give you a list of those specific to your area for sure. Okay. Yep. Just give our CARES program a shout. So, excellent question. Thanks, Lou. Okay, Laura, you want me to, next slide? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, see, I knew it wasn't going to cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> you should have brought your hammer with you. I'm so glad that I'm not in charge of that because it usually doesn't work for me. I had to use my thumb. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of times I have people come in and they'll say, you know, I don't really want to do that yet or I don't want to have someone be in charge of my decision making. And the important thing to remember is that the paperwork that you're doing, most of the time it's not in place. It, th that person doesn't have authority right away. But you have to do that planning while you're capacitated so that it can be effective down the road when if something happened and you weren't capacitated or you passed away. So I, I kind of joke with some of the ones that are harder to get them to move and get it finalized. Um, but if, if you don't make a choice, and if you don't do these documents, there are statutes in place that tell us how to handle things. And, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not right. Those are the fun stories that you hear from people um, about crazy things happening. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to do those documents and then what happens when we don't have those documents. So next. <laughs> Yes. My thumb's not working. <laughs> so let's see, the next one talks about, so first we're gonna talk about um, what Lou brought up. We're gonna talk about advanced directives and the healthcare power of attorney. So the healthcare power of attorney is the document that you use to designate who makes your healthcare decisions. Now we do have a surrogacy statute in Arizona, which means if you don't have a health care power of attorney, there's a list of people who um, the medical providers can go to to make your decisions if they have an emergency. Um, so that may be the person that you want to make your decision or it may not. And the other tricky part with that is sometimes it's multiple people. Like I have five children. So if if it was at the level of my children making that decision, then all five of my kids would have to agree. So you think those chances are high or low? Yeah, low. probably low. So, so it's always good if we have one person making that decision, they can all talk about it, but I want, an, I want one person to come in at the end of the day and say, what happens if I can't make that choice? Um, the, the healthcare power of attorney in Arizona has to be witnessed by someone who's not related to you or the person that you're appointing. It does not have to be notarized. It can be notarized, but it doesn't have to be. If you have documents from another state, they will be honored as long as they're witnessed or notarized, as, except for if you have things in the healthcare power of attorney that would not be allowable in Arizona, like 
for example, we don't we don't honor physician assisted suicide. So if that was in your paperwork, that would they would just ignore that part of it. Um, Arizona has a specific requirement because we have five geriatric psych units here. So if if someone has dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that, and and they become confused and you know a lot of times they lose their ability to speak or communicate, which creates a lot of anxiety. So they will take that individual if they become aggressive or frustrated or they lash out into a geriatric psych unit so that they don't have to be in like the drug treatment psych unit or those kinds of things and and just try to help them with anxiety medicines and things like that. That short stay in the geriatric psych unit, it's, so it's not a memory care unit, but that short stay is covered by Medicare. And in order to get your person in there or in order to get you in there, you're gonna go in there because it's usually an emergency and they're gonna hold you for 48 hours and give your family members 48 hours to file paperwork with a court to give you to give them permission to authorize the treatment unless you have what Arizona calls a mental health care power of attorney. So if you have documents from out of state, you probably don't have a mental health care power of attorney. You can access the form through the Arizona Attorney General's website. So if you go to Arizona Attorney General Life Care Planning Packet, you'll find- oh, Slow down, slow down. Sorry, oh. sir. Arizona, Arizona, Attorney. Arizona Attorney General Life Care Planning Packet, you'll find the Mental Health Care Power of Attorney form in there. And that also does not have to be notarized because sometimes, especially right now, getting a notary can be a little tricky. So it can be your next door neighbor can come over and witness it or something, somebody like that. It just has to not be anyone who's interested in the people that you chose. So if, if I say to my son, I want you to be my healthcare power of attorney, and this is, these are my end of life wishes and things like that. And he says, I don't know, mom, I could, I don't know that I could do that. What should I do? Change my healthcare power of attorney person, right? Uh -huh. So it's super important to make sure that when I review those, when I review what I've chosen or what I want with that person, um, and my physician that they understand what I want and and agree that they can follow through with that. Did you have a question, Lou? It's not a question, it's an observation. The uh, sure. uh, Secretary of State has a provision where you can actually store all these things with them and you can give out the password and, and it's You're gonna steal there. my presentation, Lou. Oh, okay, you knew that, okay. <laughs> but Lou's, Lou's right, He's he's right. And, and that's a super important point that a lot of times, in fact, every day I get an email from the bar asking if we have documents for different people. And so, especially healthcare documents, because that can be an emergency. So there is a, a free storage through Secretary of State's office. So if you have the documents, you send a copy into them. If you search through the Secretary of State's, there's a, there's a, tab that they have called registry. You just print that little registry form out, send it in, they'll send you a card. Now, um, there, there was legislation passed last year and funding just started this year to actually build a platform so that that registry would be accessible to the first responders and to all the hospitals. So eventually in the next year or so, what's gonna happen is they, they, they're coming to Laura Johnson's office. They know that they're gonna see Laura Johnson. Then the ambulance and the paramedics can look and say, does Laura Johnson have paperwork in here? Oh, look, we know that Steve Johnson is her decision maker. She has a DNR. And, and eventually they've told me that you'll be able to put into that free registry, like your medication list or other specific things that you want people to know. Right now, all you can put in there is your healthcare power of attorney and your living will. But there will be room down the road for other things. Right now, if someone needs to access that paperwork, you have to physically give them the card so they have the user ID and password. But eventually, it should be accessible to the medical community if they need it. So. Any questions about that? Not really about that. Um, 
can your health care power of attorney and your mental health power of attorney be the same person? That's a good question. Yes, and usually they are the same person. The only time that I see that they're not the same people usually is if if we're trying to be politically correct and we have too many people and we want to give everyone a job kind of a thing, or if we have a history of mental health issues and we have one person that understands our mental health history and we just trust them with that job. Okay. Thank you. And 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 the question and Cindy's asking if the physician determines capacity and the answer is yes. So the healthcare power of attorney is never effective unless the person's incapacitated. And so in practicality, how that usually ends up working is you're either making a risky decision that the physician doesn't like. And so they're, they're needing someone else to um, back them, back you up or um, you just are not able to make the decision. And that's always, that always is triggered by the physician's decision. Okay, so, so if we put, um, so it's always interesting, if we say this financial power of attorney is not effective unless we become incapacitated, and we say this healthcare power of attorney is not effective unless we become incapacitated, but then my son goes into my physician and he says, hey, I think my mom is crazy. She just bought $50,000 of QVC last night. And we need to shut this down. Um, and she says, doctor, will you write me a letter saying my mom is crazy? What is my doctor probably going to say? No. no. No, because I don't want your mom coming after me. So... It's super important to also make sure that you have the HIPAA release for the people that you name in the power of attorney so that when they come in, they can um, get access to that information. Now, a lot of times the HIPAA, the medical release is in the healthcare power of attorney. But if you have a physician that you see regularly, they want their own HIPAA release because their HIPAA release will say, I will not sue Dr. Smith ever, ever, ever. So, you know, when you go into the doctor and they give you that big packet of paper every year and they say, congratulations, we haven't seen you spend an hour filling out these forms. <laughs> when you fill out those forms, it's super important for you to put your people on there that are on your healthcare power of attorney and so that they can all have access. Um, and I would at least put the first two people on there. If, and so if I'm, if I'm trying to be politically correct and I don't want to leave any of my kids out, I can put all five of my kids on the HIPAA release so they can talk to the doctor. Do I want to put all five of my kids as decision makers so that they can make decisions together? No way. Because the purpose of this is to prevent the discussion and the fighting from happening and if I name all five of them, I just kicked the can down the road. We're going, we're going to have to go to court because there's no way that all five of them are going to agree to the same thing. It's super, super important that you put your people on the HIPAA releases if they're not your natural people. So if, if and do you have to choose your husband or your kids to be your decision makers? Nope. So if I'm choosing a licensed fiduciary or I have the bank in place or I have my best friend in place because I know she'll do what I want, it's super important that I put her on my HIPAA release so that um, she can get access to that. Because sometimes the kids or the husband can get it um, without a lot of angst from the physician. But if it's someone who's not related to you directly, it's a lot more difficult for them. Okay. Do you have a question, Lynn? I do. Um, is there a place that you get this HIPAA document list or is that just that thing that your doctor hands you every year that you've... It's, so so you, if you go to an attorney, they'll do, they'll do a HIPAA in your document. So like if you have a trust, a lot of times you'll have a HIPAA document that'll have all that stuff. You'll have a HIPAA in the healthcare power of attorney usually. The form from the state has that. 
The concern with that is the healthcare power of attorney is not effective unless you're incapacitated. So that usually means that the HIPAA isn't effective unless you're incapacitated. So if you haven't been determined incapacitated and the doctor doesn't agree that you're incapacitated and someone's trying to get your information and they need it, that can create a problem. So it's nice if it's separate They'll, they will always accept, obviously, the one that they ha that they have in their office. So that's the safest way. Okay, so, so it would be good to, next time you see your doctor, look at that list that you have. Maybe you only have your spouse on it, and you can extend that list right then, right? 100%, yep, exactly. And they will review that with you. So you can say, who's on my medical release list? They'll look it up and tell you. Okay. Thank you. Be Beverly? Shouldn't you have a HIPAA release with every doctor you go to? Yes. Yes. Because that HIPAA release will specifically release that doctor. So it'll say, Dr. Smith can give my information to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Dr. Jordan can give my... So yes, every single doctor that you go to, you'll want to put those individuals on. Good questions, ladies. Thank you. Okay, next. So this is one of the terms, one of the legal terms that often gets confused. So um, a trust is often called a living trust yeah. um, and then a living will, those two terms often get confused. But the living will is the document that says, if I have a terminal condition, then I do not want these heroic measures taken to artificially prolong my life. So it's usually pretty generic. Um, and it leaves a lot of discretion to the decision maker. But that's on purpose because if some, if I have, because I don't want to have a DNR, that's a do not resuscitate. Because that says, if Laura Johnson codes right now, don't call 911. And we don't want that because I might be fine. But if I had a terminal condition and if I was in a persistent vegetative state or a coma, then I want to let you know that I would not want these treatments. So most people start with the living will. If you then have a terminal illness or, or you have some comorbidities type things that you wanna make sure that you're not resuscitated, then you can take the next step and do the DNR. Um, the doctor has to sign off of that, sign off on that. And um, you have to post it on the wall. It's on a certain color of paper. Um, and just so that they can verify that they talked with you about it. Now, if you have a very complicated medical situation and you have very specific things that you want treatment for and don't want treatment for, there's a new form out called a POLST, P-O-L-S-T, and that's on fluorescent pink paper, and it's actually a medical order. So they put it in your medical record and it follows you everywhere and your doctor fills it out. They go through it all with you. It, okay, so now that you have this condition, do you want us to do this? Do you want us to do this? Do you want us to do this? And so it's very clear in medical terms what you want and don't want. Because often, often the DNR is, you know, they have to make a five second decision about resuscitating you or not resuscitating you. So if they're not sure if that picture is you or they're not sure, um, they can't find the DNR or something like that. Are they going to let you code or are they going to resuscitate you? They're going to resuscitate you. And so it's, the post will help a lot because then all of that information is in there. If you have a DNR and you are a true DNR, you don't want, doesn't matter what's going on. You don't want them to continue to treat you. You don't want them to start your heart again. You don't want anything. Um, my suggestion would always be to try to work with a hospice, a really good hospice. Um, I know Sylvia's on here. She works with Hospice of the West. Um, we have, um, I think, about 150 hospices in Arizona. But if we work with the hospice, then we can kind of put a care plan in place to try to make it so that that DNR is honored and no one has to call 911 so that decision doesn't ever have to be made. People are getting resuscitated when they don't want to all the time. And I know Sylvia even has a story about that, even with her situation. So um, it, you have to take some really strong 
measures and precautions and, and to try to make sure that that DNR is honored. Yes, Lou. Lou's, I'm unmuting him. Okay. Situation or location difference. Okay, say it again, because I just heard the last part of what you said, I'm sorry. Is there any situation or location difference? Uh, does this presuppose people are at home when these things happen? Or at an assisted living facility? Or at no, that's a, facility? that's a really good question. So I'll tell you that I, right before COVID, I gave a talk at a very expensive assisted living facility, and they wanted me to talk specifically only about advanced directives. And a lady came up to me at the end and she said, um, I have a DNR. Will they resuscitate me at the facility if something happens to me? They know I have the DNR. And I turned around and said to the executive director, will you resuscitate her? You know she has a DNR. And she says, we are calling 911 every time and she's going to be resuscitated. So I think, I think that is very much at the discretion of where you're at. Um, if you're at home, if it's displayed and it's very clear that it's you, they will honor it unless there's someone there who's shaking their head no that, that they want you to be resuscitated. If there's any indication, if you're trying to verbally revoke the DNR, if you have someone else there who's yelling at them to resuscitate you, because obviously if they let you pass away, they can't undo that and they don't want that liability. So you have to take some very strong, if, if you involve hospice though, then instead of calling 911, they can call hospice and, and hospice can react and work with you and have a plan in place and you don't have to do the 911 thing. Okay. Would that be true, Sylvia? She's on here. What does poll stand for? Unmute myself. Sure. You want me to talk or you want to talk yes, about polls? Go ahead. Um, if you are in an assisted living, independent living, at home, wherever you may call home, and you have a DNR and you are on hospice, you definitely will not be resuscitated. Excellent. We will honor that DNR and, the, and so will the community that you live in. So, um, the only time that it becomes a, a problem is if you're on hospice and you have not chosen a DNR, you chose to be a full code, which has happened. And then we get called in and we immediately try to talk to the power of attorney at that time and ask them to please um, have the DNR, put the DNR in place. Do you know what Pulse stands? I was trying to look it up because I would guess. I got it. I got it. Um, what is it? Well, coming up, National Pulse patient. <laughs> they don't define it either. <laughs> I'm not sure it stands for anything. I think that was one of the tricky things with that, if I remember right. Um, it does stand for something. I can't remember it either. But we, we, it, it is um, something that typically is only done with the physician yeah. and with the physician's office versus yeah. in try, facilities. Try going to Gunderson Lutheran in, I believe, um, either Eau Claire or um, Wisconsin. I think that's where Pulse started, was in Wisconsin. Uh, okay. with Gunderson Lutheran. And there's a lot of... Um, <laughs> Where's the raising hand? There's a lot of legislation in a lot of different states that honor that as a legal document. Arizona doesn't have a statute that does that, but um, but there is a strong movement here, and and there's a there's a work group right now working on how to promote it, how to train the hospitals on it, all of those kinds of things. So they are familiar with it, they do know it, and it it will be honored. So. I find I finally got it. Physician orders for life sustaining treatment. There, there you go. go. Thank you. Hey, Laura, Nola has a question. Sure. Here's my question I have a kidney transplant. 
Right now, I'm perfectly healthy, but I would like to get a DNR in my legal documents. How do I go about doing that? So if, you're, if your heart stopped beating today, do you want them to try to resuscitate you if they feel like you would be fine? No, I want to go. No matter what? No matter what. Then you go to your physician and you talk about them with that and they make sure that that's how you feel and that you understand what that means. Right. And, um, and then they will, they will sign off on the form. If you don't, if they don't have a copy of the form, let me know. There, there is a copy on the Arizona Attorney General's website that you can use, but it has to be on orange paper. Orange paper. You, I have lots of orange paper, so if you need it. <laughs> yeah, we have one on my husband. And, oh, good, um, okay. So I know what that is, but I've tried to get my primary care to do that, and she says, no, she won't. So uh, I'm thinking about going to my specialist, my kidney specialist, and seeing if he would do that. And is your husband, is he on hospice? Yes, he is. He's at a home. He has Alzheimer's. So the hospice usually will work with you at least to, to acknowledge that they've discussed it with, is that true, Sylvia? Oh, yes. And we've done well, that with I know a lot I of have a, I have a DNR for him. I'm talking about me. No, but the you as well. Usually, they'll usually facilitate yours too. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. I'll talk to the yeah, nurse. Because when they sign off, they're just acknowledging that you understand what a DNR is. Yep. So if, if you live if you, I'm sorry, go ahead, Laura. Go ahead. If you live in a facility that's either independent or assisted living, can't your primary doctor get one that you could put on your door and they would yes. not care? Yes, my, my point is just that a lot of assisted living facilities and independent their, their, their protocol is they don't care if you have the DNR, they're still going to call 911. So if you're truly a DNR, if you work with hospice, sometimes they can kind of make that. So that's not the protocol they, that the facility will call hospice, not the 911. So no one has to even make that decision. Right. Because I, I just used, I had hospice for my husband too until he passed on. And the nice thing is you have to medically qualify for hospice. So most of the hospices yeah. now have palliative programs, which are kind of pre-hospice, so you don't mm -hmm. medically qualify, but you can still be hooked into them. And so, so that's a nice option too. So if you're not medically eligible, you can still kind of say, I want to work with you <coughs> to make sure that my wishes are honored here, you know, and you can kind of help, they can help you put a plan in place. So in addition to the healthcare power of attorney, usually you have a financial power of attorney. So there are, two, there are three powers of attorney in Arizona. Um, the financial power of attorney is the document that says who can handle all of your stuff. Now this one can be effective when I sign it. So I could say, I want my husband to be able to sign for me. I'm still capacitated. He can sign for me. I can sign for me. Both of us can sign. Um, or I can say, well, I don't really want my son to be able to sign my, on my financial behalf. So when I become incapacitated, then he can be my financial power of attorney. So that's why sometimes people go to use financial powers of attorney and they'll say, we can't, we can't use this. And that would use a lot of times that's because the person has to go to the physician and get another letter saying this person shouldn't be handling their own finances trigger the incapacity clause so that they can use the power of attorney. Um, banks do not like to honor powers of attorney because how many of you have heard stories about people misusing them? A lot. So they get sued regarding those all the time. So super important for you to be persistent when you go to use a power of attorney because not unusual for the first time you go in to try to work with it that they say, you know, we don't take it or it's not valid or, you know, something like that. Laura? Yes. Most banks will have you do their own power of attorney documents or yes. signer on your account. And that has to be um, notarized as well. True. Or witnessed. 
because if you if if I go into Chase Bank and I say, look, here's my power of attorney for my mom, um, you know, will you put me on her account? They would much rather for liability purposes have my mom come in, sign that power of attorney in front of them, make a judgment call about, you know, what's going on or if I'm trying to steal all her money. So um, they'd much rather have her come in and sign us a, a power of attorney that says, Laura Johnson can be on my account at Chase Bank um, and I will never, never sue Chase Bank if she takes all my money and goes to Mexico. But here's the problem with that. If I'm incapacitated and that's the reason she did that power of attorney and now I'm trying to access to pay her bills, mm -hmm. you've got to accept it. So they will accept it. You just have to be persistent. And in Arizona, that document has to have one witness and a notary. Okay. Have a question? Yes. Is it true that your financial power of attorney and your medical power of attorney cannot be the same person? No, that's not true. A lot of times it is the same person. Okay. Um, it is true that, so it is true that if you name two people, if you say and, that it really is going to be or because everything's processed electronically nowadays. And so the bank cannot require two signatures to process. So if you put and on a document with more than one person on it, um, they'll either have them sign something saying, you know, John can go do it, you can do, go do it, it really is or, or they'll say, you know, we don't want the liability of working with this power of attorney. Can you take your money to Wells Fargo or whatever? Okay. So, um, so the powers of attorney are all, they give authority to someone to act as if they were me. Yes. So if I've passed away, I can't act, right? So the power of attorney passes when I pass. So the healthcare power of attorney, the financial power of attorney, those documents and their authority under them ends when I pass away. So at that point, someone has to take over for me, either using a trust or a will. So will the will is the document that I create to say, if anything's left in Laura Johnson's name at the end of the day, this is who receives it. So if I don't do a will, there's a statute that says, Here, here's who Laura Johnson's stuff goes to. If I do do a will, then I can opt out of that. So, so the statute for me would say my money goes to my husband and then my children. If, if I had been married before and I had, I had children from different people, it could say half of my estate goes to my husband, half of it goes to my biological children. So maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want it all to go to my husband. So then I do a will saying all my stuff goes to my husband. Then when I pass away, anything that he's not on as a joint owner or anything that he's not on as a beneficiary comes through the will and goes to him. So if I, it's really important to remember that because if, if I name someone on an account specifically as a beneficiary or joint owner, and then I say something in the will about that account that's different, the beneficiary designation always takes precedence. So I'll give you an example. So I had, I had a man who, who was in a, well, he, he had lost his wife and his really good friend had lost her husband and they kind of supported each other through that process um, and were there for each other. So after a while they started dating, um, he had three children and he had a lot of health issues. So she helped him through all that for several years he sold his house. He asked her to marry him. Um, they were really excited. He put all the money from selling his house into his bank account. Um, and she was the only one who visited him in the rehab. She's the one who took care of him when he would come home. Um, and he said, I, I really want you to have this money that's in my bank account. So he called an attorney to the facility he was in and he did a will. You know, my friend gets all my money. So unfortunately, he passed away while he was still in that home. And um, so the daughter, who hadn't showed up for the last five years, um, how long do you think it took her to show up at the bank to make the claim on the account? 
<laughs> he was he had forgotten that he named her as a beneficiary on the account when he initially set it up so mm -hmm. that takes precedence over what he put in his will so she walks in takes the three hundred thousand dollars and walks away and um you know the the friend has the will and that's it so it's really really important to make sure that the will matches what you've done on the actual accounts with those actual companies it's also important to remember that if you put a joint person on something with you so like if i go in and i put a joint if i put my son on my bank account with me as an owner he owns that account with me if he gets in an accident if he if he gets in a if he starts filing for divorce if he owes the irs money that bank account is his if he's the owner with me if he's a signer on the account or a power of attorney on the account he, there's no liability there but that authority to sign on my account ends when when i pass away so i need to have a beneficiary if he's just a signer so just important to know how that works yes luke mental health statement at time of signing yes is that something that you would recommend i think it's a good idea um because if you do legal documents the two really valid um, accusations that someone can make to get those overturned is one that you're yep that you didn't know what you were doing that you were crazy and incapacitated or that there was fraud so yep. i gave them something and i didn't tell them what it said and i said just sign here and and you know that kind of thing right so a lot of times you will sign a statement when you sign your paperwork. Um, but if the accusation's fraud, then, so I think if, if there is a question about that, and if I have any questions about that, like someone's been committed recently, or there is a recent diagnosis, because just, just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean that you don't have capacity. Um, but I will, I will say, you know, there's a good chance we're going to have an argument here. So why don't you go to your physician and just have them write a letter? I had a talk with Lou. He, he could tell me who his kids were. He could kind of tell me what he's trying to do. And, and that is huge because when you're gone, the kids put on a nice suit. They say they were your best friend, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and the court sees them for five minutes and they present really well and it's hard to tell who's lying. So anything you can do to, if you know that there might be that argument, anything you can do to solidify your capacity is always good. Um, thank you. So then, so then another option to leave money to someone is using a trust. A will always goes through probate because there has to be that link to be able to transfer the assets. So if the property is in my name, there's no way to just make it be in someone else's name. The court has to give my, my executor court paperwork. They have to record that, then they have to transfer it. So that any will, anytime we have um, assets that are being managed under a will, that has to go through probate. There's a shorter process if the value of the assets are lower, um, but the trust, all, you put all the assets in the trust, so the title doesn't have to change um, because I've already said in the trust, I want to be in charge of the trust. This is my money. I want to be the trustee of the trust because I want to be able to control when the money goes out, and here's the person that I want to take over if I can't, so this is my successor trustee. And I've said, I want to be the beneficiary because this is my money and no one becomes a beneficiary until I pass away and the trustee will then give them that money. So when I put my house in the trust and I put my insurance in the trust and I put my, uh, you can put a retirement account in the trust and you may want to, um, then, then that doesn't have to go through any type of a probate process. It, people used to use trust for tax reasons, but there's no taxes on assets you know, giving someone assets that are under eleven and a half million dollars. So most of the time people are using trust for other reasons, like we have a really young beneficiary or today I had a man who had a lot of, he had seven siblings who all are in their 70s, 80s, 
and um, not none of them had very much money. So even if he leaves them $10,000, if they've qualified for Medicaid and, and they've gone through that whole process and then he leaves them any money at all, he's gonna kick them off that program. Yeah. So if we have any special needs beneficiaries, if we have older beneficiaries who are gonna be quali qualified for Medicaid, if we have um, kids that we're worried about getting divorced um, and we don't like their spouses, we want to make sure our money doesn't go to the spouses we don't like. If we have um, anything unusual, we, we have a spouse that we want to be able to live in the house, but we want to make sure at the end of the day it goes to our biological children. Um, anything creative like that, we really need to use a trust to do those things. And the most important thing with the trust is that you get everything in it. So I know someone asked a question about life insurance. So most of the time, I think most attorneys would say that they want the trust to be the beneficiary of the life insurance policy. You can, even if you're married, I like to have the trust, the beneficiary of the life insurance policy because two times this year, I've had a situation where husband has a life insurance policy. He designates wife and then he designates the trust as the second beneficiary. So wife survives husband by a very short time. Um, one, of my, one of my clients went to the dentist a week after her husband died and she had a reaction to the medication that they used to, for the pain medicine. She passed away from that. So she never had time to go to the life insurance company and get the policy, but it's in her name and now she's passed away. So they, they have to make sure that they're releasing it to the right person. So now we have to file a probate to get that life insurance into the trust. So if if she if they had just named the trust as the primary beneficiary, um, then that wouldn't have happened. So all you have to do to do those kinds of things is call the or or get online. Some some companies have the forms online, and ask for a beneficiary form for the life insurance policy. They'll send you a new beneficiary form and follow those directions and put the trust on there as the beneficiary. You have a question? Who? Okay. Me. I do. Okay. Laura, do, what about a 401k? Do you need to put that in a trust? So it used to be, so um, the SECURE Act passed a year ago and it used to be the federal government wanted us to save as much money as possible because we were lowering social security amounts and pensions were stopping and things like that and so when they did that and they added those benefits in there i don't think they ever anticipated how much money people would save in their retirement accounts so now what we have going on is we have people with millions of dollars in iras they don't spend it, they give it to their kids, the kids don't spend it, the kids give it to the grandkids, and, and the government never gets their taxes out of the IRA or the 401k. So in December of last year, they passed a law that says, we're fine with you taking it out as slow as you want, but when it gets to your kids, we want our taxes. So you now have 10 years, once it passes to a beneficiary who's not your spouse, to take out the whole entire amount. So one of the reasons that we didn't like to name the trust as the beneficiary of the retirement accounts is because sometimes that would mess up that ability to take it out slowly. So if you're married right now under the new rules, most of the time I like, it, it depends, there's some specific things, but if you're married, I like to name the spouse as the primary so you don't give up those rights but then the trust as the backup. If, if you're single, I like to name the trust as the beneficiary because usually we have reasons that we're using a trust. And if I can take the retirement proceeds and put them through the trust, then it protects that money from all those things we were just talking about, like you don't get kicked off Medicaid and the beneficiary okay. you know, is protected from the beneficiary's creditors when they take the distributions. And maybe sometimes we have young beneficiaries and we, we don't want them to have the money yet so we can keep it in the trust. 
So if any, if any of those reasons are the reason that you set up the trust, then I like to use the trust as a beneficiary. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry for the long answer, but Laura, that's all right. I have a small question to ask you. Yes. How, the, how does the, how does the and or designation work in a, in a trust? For for decision makers, like yeah. like your trustees. Okay. Yeah, I so, have two children, and so if I said and or. What does that do to the trust? So they're going to default to or because that's what has to happen. And, and that always makes me nervous because it's kind of the same situation as we were talking about with the healthcare. So if, if my kids don't get along super, super well and they're not 100% on the same page, you know, my son Kai can go do whatever he wants and he has access to my accounts and, and my, my daughter Siri can go do whatever she wants because she has access to my accounts. And then we have people going in different directions doing different things. So if you do the and or, it's going to be or because the bank's going to require it to be that way. And if they get along, then no problem. Obviously, I see all the fun stuff. So, <laughs> so I would- Thank you. Sometimes when people really strongly want to do that, I'll say, how about we put one in charge of the health and one in charge of the finances and then they can back mm -hmm. up. Yes, Nola. Okay, I'm confused. I need clarification. Okay. Back on the life insurance. Okay. Right now, my husband, even though he's incapacitated, if something were to happen to me, that money would go for his care. He's okay. number one beneficiary. Okay. Am I, should I leave that and put the trust as second or should I put the trust first and him second? How, how do I do that? Or should I do that? So if you have a married trust, he is the trust and, and you have, you don't have, he's not on all texts or anything like that. No, no. Okay. So, so it sounds to me like in a vacuum, I'm answering this question, but I would put him as the primary, I, I'm sorry, I would put the trust as the primary beneficiary. Okay, super, thank you. All right, okay, next. I have a couple of questions. One, yeah. at the bottom of the trust page, it says it must be funded, what does that mean? That means that the assets have to be retitled. So sometimes, sometimes people think that when they do the trust, the house magically is in the trust and the life insurance magically is in the trust and that's not true. You have to go to the life insurance company and make change the beneficiary. You have to do a deed on the house and put it in the trust. You have to, you have to tie everything to the trust because that's how it works. Okay. Okay. If, if, if you have a will and you just have a will and you're married and everything that you have, IRAs, anything that you have, your house, everything is in both of your names. Is it still gonna go through probate when somebody dies? No. no. But sometimes that's not the only question. So that's, that's why people use trusts. So sometimes if your goal is to get the money to the person, then you just name them as a beneficiary. If your concern is different than that, like, like I have an 80 year old sister and she's on Medicaid and she can't get money, or I want to give money to my five year old granddaughter, or I hate my daughter's husband and I want those have to, we have to use a trust to do those things. Okay. Those are to protect people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just really fast, a lot of times people get nervous because they hear stories and they get scared about, um, they always tell me, I don't want to be the bag lady on the corner and I don't, you know, I want to be able to afford to pay for this long-term care situation. So always think about um, what you're doing and why you're doing it and things like that. And so with the SECURE Act before, we were holding on to our IRAs and our 401ks as long as possible, passing it to the kids who pass it to their kids. But now a lot of times we're our, our technical income might be social security and maybe a little bit of pension. So our income is low. The kids are still working. So if I don't take any of my money out of my IRA and I send it all to them, there's a high probability that they're going to pay a lot higher tax on it than I would. 
So I don't have to spend it, but it might be it might be a smart financial move for me to be taking it out of the IRA wrapper um, and getting it so that I can pay at my tax rate and not their tax rate. So that's a consideration that you always need to think about. If I'm getting required minimum distributions and I don't want those and I don't want to pay taxes on them, a great idea is to donate it to a charity. They'll take the required minimum distributions. They don't pay tax on it. And Avia accepts those every year. Um, one of the things to consider sometimes, in fact, I had this discussion yesterday. Um, the son was worried because the dad had been put on long-term care benefits and the mom was aging and the only asset she had was the house. And he said, how about she just gifts the house to me? So one of the considerations, she can gift the house to him and put the house in his name, but she paid $50,000 for the house and the house was worth $300,000. If she gifts the house to him and he has to sell it to pay for her care, he's gonna pay capital gains tax on, on $250,000 worth of money if she keeps it in her name and he inherits it or she sells it and then gives him the cash, there's no capital gains tax due. So, so that's just, and there's not a right or wrong answer. It's just a consideration that you have to keep in mind. Um, you've heard of the five-year look back. So it's always important to understand that if that transfer happens within five years of applying for benefits, and it's three years right now for the VA, but three years for the VA, five years for Medicaid, um, you have to disclose that asset and there'll be a certain period of time that that person doesn't get benefits. So it's not, they don't get mad at you, they don't slap your hands, you're not in trouble, but you have to disclose it and then the penalty is assessed from the point that you apply, not from when the transfer was made. So if I paid for my granddaughter to go to college three years ago and, and I gave her $20,000 and now I go to apply for Altex, I have to disclose that and they say, okay, Laura, you need to wait three months because you gave her $20,000. Um, I always wanna be careful. Cons included in that are charitable gifts. So if I pay the state um, and the VA, consider me giving charitable gifts and um, like paying tithing or those types of things, consider that all gifts. So if I regularly pay tithing, that's a gift as far as they're concerned and that's adding up um, for that five year window and I have to disclose that down the road. Uh, sometimes I'll have um, people give things to their kids just because they're nervous and then they don't think about the kids situation. So real once the kids become the owner or that other person becomes the owner it's theirs if they owe the irs money if they're in the middle of a divorce if their dumb kid goes and hurts someone in a car accident that thing that that house that i just gave them is totally not protected because it's not their primary residence and and um it is theirs so that's always a consideration and sometimes things happen where I want to do something. So I, I did have a situation where a um, man lost his wife. He put his son on the house with him as a joint owner. He got a new wife uh, and they decided they wanted to move. And so he says to his son, you know, let's sell the house. I want to move, you know, over here with her. And son said, no way. So half a house, is that marketable? Am I going to be able to sell half my house? Probably not. So, so just re, so just take into consideration that when you have that person on there with you, you know, you could be restricting it. Um, there is, you'll hear people say that it, you can't give more than fifteen thousand dollars in one year. That's not true. You can, you can give eleven and a half million dollars during your lifetime. If you give more than 15,000 in one year to one person, you're supposed to file a form with the government to tell them that you did that. And it takes that amount off of your $11.5 million. So you're supposed to file the return, but you don't owe any taxes. Just, just some things to think about. 
if someone doesn't do their planning, then um, we have to go to court. So if someone refuses to do health care documents, we go to court to do a guardianship. If someone refuses to do financial documents, we go to court to do a conservatorship. So these are what we call living probate. So the person is still alive and we need to take control of their assets. Um, it's, it's a really frustrating process because it's a situation of last resort and no one ever wants to be there if you don't have to be. Um, the court does a good of, as good of a job as they can, but when we go through this process, the person who's incapacitated gets their attorney, um, you get your attorney, and, it, and, the, per, and the person who's incapacitated, they, their attorney has a responsibility to tell the court what they want, whether it's good or bad or makes sense or not. So if my husband's mad at me because he has dementia and he thinks I stole money, I have stolen money from him, he's going to tell his attorney that I stole money from him and he does not want me to be his person. So that attorney is going to come back in and say he doesn't want her. So then we're going to get a third attorney involved. And if we have a mental health situation, we're all going to be doing this in an emergency. So we're all, all the attorneys are dropping their schedules. The court's dropping its schedule. We're all trying to get into court. And how much money do you think that costs at the end of the day? Buck 280. <laughs> it's a, it is not unusual just the first year to be 35000 in attorney's fees. And the person who's incapacitated gets to pay all those fees. So, um, yes. Who determines the incapacitation? So that's the treating physician of the person that we're saying is incapacitated or if they don't have a treating physician, we have to send someone in. So then you have the battle of the medical professionals because sometimes one will say they're capacitated and one won't, um, and that's really fun. So super, and, and then one of the nice things about your legal documents, like if you do a power of attorney or you do a trust, you can say in it, this is what has to happen to show that I'm incapacitated. You have to get two letters from two different doctors. You have to go to this group of people and they all have to agree. You have to, um, my spouse has to say I'm incapacitated in one doctor. So you can pick what incapacity looks like if you do the documents beforehand. Um, the other nice thing about the conservatorship is that you get a file, even if you're married, you get a file in accounting every year and the court looks at everything that that money is spent on and you have to justify it, which is super frustrating for a lot of people. So the most important decision that you make when you're thinking about all of this is who your decision maker is because legally they have to do X, Y, Z, but if Joey just got out of jail, for stealing a bunch of money from his employer and I put him in charge of my finances and there's not a whole lot of oversight, what happens? You're in Joey, trouble. Joey steals my money. So um, make sure that you have a contingency plan, especially if you're a caregiver, there's, there's a whole emotional thing that goes along with removing your spouse who has issues. You don't have to remove them legally. You can just get that letter of incapacity, put it with the documents, and they're automatically skipped, which is nice. Um, yes, Nola. What's the difference between a fiduciary and a conservatorship? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Okay, so that's one of the things that we're going to... So legally, the term fiduciary means someone who's in charge of your money for you. So mm -hmm. when the bank has an account for me and they're holding my money, they are my fiduciary. If someone's acting as a power of attorney, they are that person's fiduciary. If they're acting under the will as an executor, they're the fiduciary. So Arizona has licensed fiduciaries because we would have people helping each other in these retirement communities and then they would start taking advantage of people um, where they're charging them extra money and then they become beneficiaries. So the Supreme Court said, we want to be in control of that and we want to make sure that that's happening on a up and up level. So we're going to license people who are not related to, if they're making decisions for someone else and they're not related to them, and they're doing this on a regular basis, we want to license them. 
So they go through a licensing process, they are bonded, and then that you can hire them and name them as your decision maker or as your backup decision maker. So sometimes if I have an 80 year old sister who knows me best and I want her as my decision maker, but I'm not sure she's gonna be there and I can put the fiduciary on as a backup, my sister can call them and say, I'm Laura's sister, I'm in charge, I can't get to Arizona, can you go check on her and help me navigate this? So the nice thing about that too is um, the fiduciary who's private and licensed doesn't make money off of your investments like a bank would if they were doing it. So um, they're going, they get paid by the hour when they actually do things for you. So they don't care if I have $5 million or $100,000, they're going to, they're going to treat me just the same. So that's the fiduciary. The conservator is the appoint, is the person is appointed by the court to be my financial decision maker. So a fiduciary could be a conservator. And a conservator is a fiduciary, but may, might not be a licensed fiduciary. So the conservator is handling the money for someone else. So because they're in that role, they're a fiduciary. A private licensed fiduciary may be, so if if I go into court and, and all my family has taken advantage of me and spent a ton of my money and, and the court cannot trust any of my family members, they have a list of licensed fiduciaries. They're gonna say, you all are crazy. We're appointing a licensed fiduciary third party because you guys have stolen this money from her. And, and then I will get this person um, who will be my financial decision maker. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Lou. Oh, hold on, you're muted. Jay will have to unmute you. There we go. There you go. How much do the conservators and or fiduciaries make? You talked about hourly uh, for that's, that's a good. That's a good question. So um, if it's a family member, depending on how they got appointed, um, they charge hourly. If it's someone who's not related, who's not a fiduciary, they may not be able to charge anything. If it's a licensed private fiduciary, they're gonna charge anywhere from $30 an hour to, I, I think I've seen it about 180. Ooh, but it just depends on what they're doing. Um, yeah. So if they're opening your mail, they're gonna charge $30. If they're, if it's 2 a.m. in the morning and they're going to the hospital to check on you and make sure that, you know, what's happening is supposed to be happening, um, then you're going to be paying $180 or $150 or $125 to have them sitting there with you. But the way you get good care is to have someone paying attention to what's going on. Sure. And if you have all your family out of state, that paying attention to what's going on is worth its weight in gold. So, okay, any, any questions about decision makers? Okay. So Lou, when he hijacked my whole presentation, no, just <laughs> here is the- I got more, I got more. I'm sure you do. Here's <laughs> the website to the registration agreement through the Secretary of State's office, and they will do that healthcare. Um, a couple other thoughts about storing documents. Um, you can, I've never had someone's um, estate planning documents stolen from their home. Usually when people come in, they don't want paper. So the, the danger is more fire and water damage. So like Amazon has a $30 um, awesome thing that you can pop all your documents into. It's, it's like an envelope that's fireproof, waterproof. It's like $30. Um, so if, but sometimes people use safety deposit boxes. Super important that if I choose to use a safety deposit box, which you don't have to do, but if I do, if I put my trust in the safety deposit box and I'm the only one on it and I do the trust so no one has to go to probate, but no one can get in the safety deposit box because it's in my name and I've passed away. And now they have to go to probate to get into the safety deposit box to get the trust that I put in there because I didn't want to do a probate, that's a little counterproductive. So 
make sure if you have a trust that the safety deposit box is in the trust so the trustee can access it so when the next person takes over or add another signer to the safety deposit box so they can get into it but make sure that they know where that person knows where it is and they can get into the safety deposit box um, make sure that you know that your person knows where your original documents are and um, also if you've worked with an attorney it's a really good idea to give them the attorney's card so they can get them paperwork in an emergency if they need it and sometimes documents disappear so it's nice for your person to know who you worked with so if something disappeared you could get a copy of it um, giving your successor passwords can totally save the day and if you're a caregiver and even if you're not a caregiver I strongly encourage you to put something together that kind of preserves your dignity and identity and I call that a caregiver notebook but if if I hate the Beatles and they and i'm in music therapy and i can't communicate any longer how do they know that i why i'm agitated every single time they send me to music therapy and that lady only plays the beatles how do they know that i'm allergic to peanut butter cookies and that i hate them because a lot of times as we lose our communication with dementia or parkinson's or things like that our likes and dislikes are preserved and our and our feelings are preserved we just can't tell people what's going on so if you like to be in the sun and you like to be warm and you hate salad and you love pizza just some information like that put together with your other documents can be super helpful if they if you know someone can understand that you're an architect and that's what you like to do or you know it just really helps um, helps make sure that the caregiving is quality. The things I th see people fight over often, often, often are burial, um, funeral type things, especially cremation. So if you want to be cremated, especially if your decision makers are not your spouse or your children, make sure that you prepay for that so that it's clear and they're not trying to contact your eight brothers and sisters and get consent and all they want to know is if they get money and they you know they don't they don't want to sign off on something and it's just it just can be very a cr very crazy time um, make sure that if family members want specific personal items that you're very clear about who gets that arizona is a holographic will state so you can write um you can write out who should receive personal property items and if you sign that and date it it's legally binding so um if you if if my five kids all want the grand piano that I have, and I know that they're gonna hate each other till the end of time and fight over it, I should and have a responsibility to say which one of them gets it so that that doesn't happen. Okay, next. One last thing on this, if you would. Yeah. There are lots of internet uh, op options for storing documents. Yes. Yeah. One, of, one of the real good ones is box.com, HIPAA approved. You can store things other than just, uh, just the uh, uh, things that we're talking about. Perfect, yes. There's another one called DocuBank that's very popular. Yes. And those are, those are paid for. I'm happy if anybody does anything. Um, the state is free, so I sign all my clients up for that, and because it'll be accessible by the different hospitals, I want them in that system too. But um, you're right, a lot of times you have other things that need to be stored. The, re the real benefit of this is you have a little uh, card that you give whoever you want to give it to, have, a, have the uh, password. If you go to the hospital, uh, they look, look up the stuff and it's right there, there's no problem. Okay. Yep, it's excellent. It's excellent. So um, let's see, we have, sorry, I took more time that, but, but you'll all enjoy the story because it'll tell you a little bit about me. So my grandfather married my great aunt three months after I lost my grandmother. So my dad's um, cousins became his stepbrothers three months after he lost his mom. So you can imagine how that went over. And my parents had amassed a huge piece of land in northern Arizona, or my, gran my grandparents had put that together. 
So all of the kids wanted to know what happened, what happens with that land. And my grandpa, who's a World War II vet um, and not very forthcoming with private information, says to his kid, it's all taken care of. And so my dad, who's a Vietnam vet, who has his own issues, who's not very forthcoming, says, okay, so no one asks what that means, right? And in my dad's mind, it means something completely different from my grandfather's mind. So when my grandpa passes away, all three of those kids were in my office within hours, very, very, very angry about what my grandpa had chosen to do. It, and and they, they can't talk to him. He can't explain it to them. They're just asking me why. If you're doing something that's unusual or that you think that the family will object to, um, help your decision maker person out by writing a letter to the family, explaining yourself so that there's some, so that they can give that to those people. The same goes with end of life decisions. So sometimes we have someone who's been involved in the process, they're very clear about what you want, and then there's other people who are out of state who haven't been involved. And they come in and they feel bad because they haven't seen you and now they want to spend this time with you and they're like no you can't pull the plug now it's not time so this if you're wanting to discuss the decisions with your decision maker which i think is a great great really important idea this document called the five wishes is five dollars um, it's fabulous sometimes hospice will provide it to you sometimes they have copies um, but it, it's a great discussion about what you want, when you want it, how you want it, and it's just more thorough because sometimes you're not quite sure what to ask. So, explain what it's all taken care of means. <laughs> and we do have it for free, Laura. So if anyone you, needs it, just let me know. Thank you. So just some, just some ideas, you know, fear is often sold to people as they age. Um, so any, don't feel bad if you keep your assets cash and people say, you're not getting any money off that. Yeah, well, when the market tanks, like it did in February, March, you didn't lose any money. There's no magic bullet that if you didn't have any money, now you're gonna have a ton of money, so don't, don't start moving stuff around or buying financial products because you're trying to create more money that doesn't exist. Go see an elder law attorney and really talk about what you need to do because you do have a lot of options and Arizona is a great place to have long-term care expenses. Yes, Nola. I gotta go. I will, thanks Laura for everything. I appreciate I it. It was fabulous to meet you. Same here, bye-bye. All right. Don't be afraid to use your IRAs or, or reduce the IRAs or things like that. They're, they're yours. In my experience, people too often live without what they need to get the money to the kids. The kids don't appreciate the money. They didn't earn it. They spend it quickly. It's a windfall to them. I'm not saying you can't give it to them, but use the money to, to get what you need, especially if you're the caregiver, to get some help. On the second to last slide, what did you mean by caretaker or long-term care insurance? Um, so obviously someone who is diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's won't be able to be underwritten for long-term care insurance. But, sure. the care, but the caregiver might want to investigate that because once it can't, if your spouse isn't there to kind of help facilitate that, it makes it even more important to think about what the options are for you if you need a caregiver down the road. So long-term care insurance may be an option, it may not, but investigate it and see if it is. I still don't understand for the caregiver. Long-term care insurance. So that so if my husband has Alzheimer's, he's not gonna qualify for long-term care insurance. Obviously. But I, I might, and, and if he's gone because he already has Alzheimer's, he's not gonna be able to be my caregiver, and take I may not. Of, take care of you. Yes, and okay. I might not want my five kids to be my caregivers, so oh. I, it might be even more important when I know that he's been diagnosed for me to get long-term care insurance for myself so that I don't have to rely on my kids. Gotcha, thank you. Sure. 
Um, if you have any questions about Altex, which is our Medicaid program, which pays for long-term care or VA benefits, anything like that, please let me know. I'll send you out some specific information that speaks to that. And we can do another presentation if you want on those specific items. Um, so I think that that's almost it, right? Just, these are just some suggestions about making it a little bit easier. There, there really isn't. So if, if someone passes away and I have to step up and handle their, or even if they become incapacitated, there's not really a magical place that I can go to to find out what they have. So in that notebook that I'm going to put together about what I like and don't like and want, like I really want to stay home. I don't care if you spend every dime. I want to, you know, please don't feed me pizza or whatever. I also want to put in there what my assets are and I want to keep that up to date so that my person doesn't hate me because they had to spend a year trying to find all my assets. And if you're a caregiver, then kudos to you. Give yourself a pat on the back for showing up and, and give yourself a little grace. So these are some websites to, so a lot of times people don't know that these um, things exist. So when you are released from a hospital, um, that social worker that works with you is paid by the hospital. But you can always hire your own social worker to help you navigate all of this and pay them. Um, so those are called geriatric care managers. And especially in situations where people don't have family members in the state, I think they're, they're just fabulous. And we have some really great ones um, in this area. So that's the website for if you were wanting to find your own private social worker that could kind of help you. Um, it's also good if like the kids are saying, you're not safe, you need to move into assisted living and you're saying, I'm just fine. It's a good way to kind of mitigate that so the care manager can kind of come in, make an assessment for the kids and work to assure them, you know, these are the things we're going to do so you can stay home longer and things like that. Um, this is the, the second is the list of licensed fiduciaries in Arizona. Make sure you read the complaints about them. They're all online. Understanding that these fiduciaries are handling mentally ill individuals and different things like nasty families, but it is important to read the complaints and just understand. And then if you wanna work with an elder law attorney who focuses on people as they age and how that's gonna look in the long term, um, that's the website for elder law attorneys. I think that's it, right? Thank you so much for your time and, and good questions. I hope it was helpful. And if you do have any questions, I really will answer them um, today or any other day. Looks like Lou has his hand up. Hi, Lou. Hello again. Uh, your average charge for a simple trust. It depends if it's if it's new um, and I'm going to be doing all the funding and I'm going to be doing ancillary documents um, with it like powers of attorney and things like that. If you're single, I only have to do one set of documents. So somewhere between $900 and 2000 if you're married, probably somewhere between um, 1500 and 3500 depending on what I have to do. Thank you. Sure. Beverly has a question as well. Hi, Beverly. Oh, we're still muted. Hold on, Beverly. We're trying to unmute you. Jay doesn't really want you to have a question. <laughs> no, I do. It's just being uncooperative. You can try to unmute yourself as well. Hi. Hey, your clicker finger needs work. No. Underneath, when you when you had the long term care telephone number on on, uh, I'm sorry, not the long term care, the law, the law attorney phone number. Elder was, law. What was that? It was, it was half. Half available and half not available. So. So this yeah. one right here. 
Yeah, could you give okay. us the last one on the bottom? So it's www.nela, National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. So it's N as in Nancy, A as in Apple, E as in Edward, L as in Laura, A as in Apple.org. N N A E L A L A. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Sure. And we have your phone number to call you though too. Yeah, that last slide has my phone right. number right. if you have a question. Right. Paul, you had a question? Yeah, it's the world changing. I've got in my case, uh my bills, most of my bills are automatically withdrawn from my bank. They don't send statements anymore. In the old days, you know, if somebody died, you just That's pick up weird. the mail and you know right. where all their accounts and everything are. Yep, yep you're right. So I'm trying to, I guess, get together a list of where my accounts are and maybe mm -hmm. passwords for them so my, like my sister could log into my accounts. Fabulous. But I don't want that somewhere where like some bad person gonna get a hold of it. So so there are about I know there's at least 15 or 20 really good um, programs or services that you can use to do that. Um, Benavia might have a list of those. If they don't or you want some suggestions, let me know and I'll I'll send you out some different websites you can look at. There's even on your phone now you can use that are mm -hmm. safe systems. That you have a master password to keep everything, all your information in your, in your brain. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. And you're 100% right. When someone comes in to me and they say, so and so passed away, what do I do? I have to look at them and say, okay, so put on your private investigator hat, start getting the mail, go, go pull their tax return and look at that. You know, and, and a lot of times, something gets missed if they don't have a list like that. So just so you know, after a certain period of time, usually two years, the financial institution hasn't had any contact with you, they'll hand that account over to the state. There's now a national um, bank called missymoney.com and you can go in there and look up someone's name and where they live and if money was handed over because it wasn't claimed, it'll be in there. But it takes a while to get there, and it takes a ton of paperwork to get it out of there. Um, if it's in that system for a certain period of time, then it goes to the state. Okay. Well, thank, thank you all for your time. If you hated the presentation, then Jay was in charge and it's all his fault. <laughs> Maybe they'll fire me. But if you liked it, then I did it. Thanks. So, no, no, I'm just kidding. But I think Jay will have like an evaluation for you to fill out um, and make some suggestions to the group or something like that. So please do that so that we can make these presentations better. Some of the, the Zoom classes I've been to like with the doctor's office and that, they will put a what on the website that you can print out the whole the whole things that you showed us. Okay, I know that Jay will either send that to you. Do you if he has your email? I don't know. He'll have to tell you. What, okay. What we do is I've been recording this entire presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll have that. If you'd like, I can send you an email with Laura's presentation if that's okay. Yep, yes, that's great for me. Okay. Yeah, no, that would be fine follow-up information from Laura and her firm, um, some important information um, that we'll be emailing to you in the next day. Well, probably within, of course, I'll be getting that. Okay. And if you have any questions, you know, or if there's something else you need to find out about or just give me a call and I'll get a hold of Laura or we'll find the resources. And I think someone's waving at me. Kevin? Kevin, yeah. And if you yeah. if you have friends or family that that need touch or um, you know especially during this pandemic it's crazy so please reach out to Benavia we have a lot of resources um, to help most definitely most definitely and I, I I can only recommend being that we're in the midst of the holiday season getting your all your documents and your estate and your planning in order could be one of the best Christmas gifts you can give your your kids and family yes. Right. Kevin, you had a question? Yeah, um, I got on this uh, uh, Zoom um, 
two reasons. Number one, I want to be like Jay Lick Lickus when I grow up. <laughs> number two. What a, what a crowd. And number two, Laura, do you uh, do anything? Uh, I'm a real estate agent, and that's one of the reasons why I got onto this, because uh, our last three listings, we probably run into where there is just nothing set up. So do you get into, uh, like, if I get a client that has no clue on what, what to do, a family member? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll get your that. information from Jay or something, and uh, we'll go from there. Excellent. Yeah, all the time. Most certain. Thanks. When people do their own deeds. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been crazy this last uh, month. Um, I know. A lot of family have come in. They have no beneficiary deed, no will, no yep. trust. Yeah. Um, you know, where do we go? Who do we contact? Yeah. That kind of stuff. Sixty percent of Americans. Right. Yeah, Laura. Yes. Yes. Bob. Three years ago, my husband and I sat down and we made a list of contacts, okay? Great. Um, if, if anything happened to him or happened to me. And, and that was really, really helpful when he passed away this year. You're, ab you're absolutely right. Um, and if, if you're in the, if someone on the call is at a point where they're wanting to put together one of these notebooks or something like that, um, I I just bought um, I just bought the PDF from one of the good people in the community um, who does that. So if you'd like if you'd like some of that, let me know and I'll pay to print you out a copy. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having. Thanks for being here, Beverly. Thank you all. If if thank you, you very much. Well done. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, you all. Laura. All right. Have a great day and I'll be safe. Okay. Be sane too. Yeah. No kidding. That might be even more important. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Bye. 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 Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Mm -hmm.